Okay, ladies and gentlemen, today, Pipe Welding Procedures, second edition. We're going to be reading chapter 8, starts on page 100. Welding thin wall pipe. Um, this particular chapter, I'm most interested in, in the downhill aspects of this. Although you can, uh, it does talk about doing some horizontal and, and uh, uphill with it. But the focus is going to be on the downhill aspects of it. Really a good chapter. A lot of excellent, excellent information in it. Uh, as we go through here, I'm going to be suggesting some things that you should highlight. Uh, that will help to focus you on the test that will be given. Uh, looks like from my notes in here, there's going to be 36 questions on the test. Uh, I'd consider that to be a, a rough guess. It could be as many as 40. It could be as few as, as 30. So anyway, as we go through here, I'd like you to highlight those sections that I, that I mentioned to you. They're, they're going to be important to you. So on chapter, uh, chapter 8, page 100, I'm going to start in the second paragraph, middle of that second par paragraph. They're talking about downhill welding. Because it is a, a faster method, downhill welding is preferred for welding cross-country pipelines, where the pipes are usually made of low-carbon mild steel, and this method of pipe welding will be emphasized in this chapter. Dropping down to where it says uphill welding, very high quality pipe joints, and I would highlight this, can be made using the uphill welding method to weld both large and small diameter thin wall pipe. It is recommended for, for welding high alloy pipe and in other cases where only the highest quality welded joint will be accepted. In fact, a lot of companies now, they'll give what they call a super coupon test on two inch pipe, double extra heavy, um, using 6010 and 7018 fill and cap. And if you can do that in the vertical up position, then it qualifies you for all, all diameters and all thicknesses under ASME. And that's what they're given now. And that would be a high quality pipe, pipe weld if you can make that. Um, dropping down on page 101, second paragraph, it says, because more heat is retained in the weld zone when welding small diameter thin wall pipe, the temperature of the weld is often very high when the cover, cover pass is, is deposited. That's important because if you overheat that thin wall pipe, uh, it can cause your weld bead to sag, it can cause undercutting uh, on the sides, and it can also uh, adversely affect the heat affected zone. If you'll turn the page to uh, downhill welding, off these next two pages there's going to be five questions, so I would read and understand all of this. It says, thin wall pipe can be welded by the downhill weld method. Uh, downhill welding is very fast and economical. Consequently, it is, it is used extensively to weld cross-country pipelines. Uh, in the majority of cases, the wall thickness of the pipes used for cross-country pipelines is within the range of thickness that can be welded by this method. High quality welds can be made on thin wall pipe by the downhill weld method. No laxity in the quality of the pipe joint is permissible when the pipeline must transport crude oil, natural gas, and other fuels. One example of a laxity, okay, and I've talked about this, I probably, anybody taking this class has probably been with us for a while, so I've probably mentioned this before. If you've got a weld pipe right here and you've got a weld joint there, one thing, one bit of laxity is if you're welding this thing down and you just, you get a little sloppy and you put an arc strike out across there, that's a cutout. That's a cutout. So that's what they're talking about. No laxity in the quality. Um, leaks and other defects can present a danger to life and property as well as to, to be the cause of environmental damage. Most cross-country pipelines are buried underground for almost their entire length. In order to be certain that they are sound, it is normal procedure to test over 50% of the welds. Uh, the procedure for downhill welding is different from that for uphill welding. The molten puddle of metal tends to roll down the pipe in the same direction as the arc is traveling. Moreover, the fluid slag in the molten metal also flows in, in this direction and unless this, is, this can be controlled, there is a danger of the slag inclusions occurring. Uh, as you're welding, you, you're welding downhill like so, that slag has a tendency to try to overrun 
your electrode. And if it overruns your electrode and gets in front of you, you can weld right over it and not even realize it. So you've got to be very careful with that. Uh, in order to deposit a sound layer of weld metal, the arc must constantly be kept ahead of the molten pool of metal. This is done by using a high current setting and a fast speed of travel. As a result, the layers of weld metal are thinner when compared to uphill welding. You simply don't carry as much steel when you're welding downhand as you do when you, when you uh, weld uphill. Next page, um, figure 8-4 illustrates a typical de uh, deposition of the weld beads in a joint when welding a cross-country pipeline. As usual, four tack welds are made to hold the pipes in place, following which the root bead is welded, starting from the top of the pipe and welding to the bottom. After the root bead has been welded entirely around the pipe, the second pass, called the hot pass, is welded. The primary objective of this hot pass is to correct any defects in the root bead. A relatively small amount of metal is deposited by this pass. A third intermediate bead is then deposited, which is followed by the cover pass to the finish weld. Um, so the hot pass then is, is meant to simply correct anything that, that's wrong with the root pass. And what happens is API 1104, which is the code covering this, American Petroleum Institute, 1104 code for oil, re, uh, oil refineries, cross-country pipelines. It allows a certain amount of defects on that root bead. You could have, for example, say a little bit of internal undercut, and it'd be acceptable as long as it doesn't exceed certain limits. You could have a, a certain amount of IP, insufficient penetration, where you don't, don't come all the way through. Um, so when you put that hot pass in, a lot of times when I inspect one of these things, and I, and I see these things, I could fail a guy. Because under this code, there's one all-encompassing statement that says this bead will present a consistent and workmanlike appearance. Well, if I see this stuff, hey, that's not a consistent and workmanlike appearance. You're done. And a lot of inspectors working for individual pipeline companies will use that because their standards are very high. Uh, usually, if a guy comes in here to, to the college and asks to take a test, and I see these things, and they're still within code, but they're, they're a little funky looking, I'll say, all right, put your hot pass in there, and let's see if you can push it on through or correct it. And that's what this book is talking about. The hot pass is used to correct some of these inconsistencies. So they might come on the outside of this and do a little grinding and fix their starts and stops, put their hot pass in, and then the hot pass will push that lack of fusion on, on through or it might fill up that little bit of undercut. That's the purpose of our hot pass. It's not really to deposit a whole lot of metal in the downhill position, but it's to correct any inconsistencies uh, on the root pass. Okay, flip the page, uh, 104. Horizontal, 2G welding, uh, outdoor pipeline welding, read those topics. Right below uh, figure 8.5, I want to read from your text, says weld cracking can be a problem when welding pipe outdoors, particularly when welding large diameter pipes having a higher alloy content. Several different grades of steel are used in pipeline construction and are designated by the API standard as X42, X52, X56, X60, and X65. The alloy content in these pipes uh, with an increase in number de okay, the alloy content increases in these pipes with an increase in the number designation. The tensile strength and other mechanical properties also increase in the higher numbered pipes. This progressive increase in properties is the result of the greater alloy contents, principally carbon, man uh, manganese, and perhaps silicone. And what those numbers mean is not the tensile strength, and you may already know this, but I'm going to mention it anyway. But X42, X52, X60, etc., that is the yield strength, not the tensile strength. The tensile strength is typically about 10,000 more. So whenever you're talking about any of these uh, pipe designations, just remember it's tensile strength, or pardon me, yield strength. Top of page 105, um, 
Remember, we're talking about cracking. It says another form of cracking that occurs, particularly on pipe having a somewhat higher alloy content, is underbead cracking. Underbead cracking uh, is caused by hydrogen entrapment. You can get hydrogen in a weld bead. Let me just draw a bead here. All right, you've got your root, you filled and capped all of this. And uh, as you were welding, a source of hydrogen got into there somewhere. Maybe you didn't drive the moisture out. Maybe you didn't preheat it properly. Maybe you got some grease off the gloves uh, that you're wearing. Somehow or other, some hydrogen got sucked into the weld while you were making that weldment. What happens is, when, when one of these uh, welds solidify, it solidifies from the parent metal into the weld, like this. And it'll just start solidifying as it cools, and it just solidifies in here and it makes a little lattice structure. The hydrogen that gets trapped in there forms molecules and it nestles in these grain boundaries in here. Well, they're too big to stay there. And so they exert pressure on these grain boundaries. And what happens is, uh, over time, it can cause these to crack. And that's what your underbead cracking is. And it'll normally occur in the heat affected zone. That is the area adjacent to the weld metal. The heat affected zone is that area of the parent metal that was changed by the heat of welding, but it didn't get hot enough to melt. And that's where you're going to have most of your underbead cracking. Okay, underbead cracking can occur in pipes having a higher alloy content when the weld is cooled too rapidly and when moisture is present. Therefore, the weld joint should not be allowed to cool to, t to the temperature of the surrounding air because the heat retained in the weld will slow down the cooling rate of the next bead to be welded. In the field, this means that the second layer should be welded as soon as possible after the previous layer is finished, preferably within five to seven minutes. Uh, on a large diameter pipe, it is not possible for a single welder to weld fast enough to maintain the desired interpass temperature in the weld joint. In order to maintain this temperature, it is not unusual to see as many as two to four welders working on a single weld joint simultaneously. High winds can also cause the weld to cool too rapidly to maintain the desired interpass temperature, especially if the air is cold. Unless a windshield is placed around the welding area, welding should be stopped if the wind velocity exceeds 25 to 30 miles per hour. I'd continue reading the rest of that. Uh, when you get that wind blowing, it can actually quench, air quench the, uh, the weld and, and cause a, a martensite structure to form. Uh, preparing the pipe joint. It says C figure 8.6. This is a standard joint specification for fit thin wall pipe. You'll note that we have a 1 16th inch uh, land or root face and a 1 16th inch root opening with a 70 degree included bevel angle. Um, your joint fit up is extremely important. It's an essential variable. So you want to make sure that when you fit these up that you get it as accurate as you possibly do. Uh, reading this topic says, in the field, the sections of pipe to be welded together have usually been beveled in a shop before they arrive on the job. Should this not be the case, then it will be necessary to cut and bevel with an oxyacetylene cutting torch and a grinding wheel. The surface of the bevel must be ground smooth and all traces of the tightly adhering oxide uh, coating left by oxyacetylene cutting must be t uh, from the torch must be removed. So you wanna go, you're going to want to get in there, if you have to bevel one in the field, get in there and, and clean it up uh, to clean white metal before you ever try to fit it. Otherwise, it could cause problems. Welding the tacks, I'm reading from the middle of this first paragraph. It says, when the wall thickness of the pipe is one eighth of an inch or less, a one eighth inch electrode is used. Uh, for thicker wall pipe, a five thirty second inch electrode is used. Low hydrogen electrodes cannot be used for downhill pipe welding. They simply produce too much slag. A very high current setting should be used when welding the root bead by the downhill method. As an estimate, it should be between 100 and 140 amps uh, for nipples used in practice welding. Uh, but again, it depends on the, on the size of the electrode that you're using. And typically, we use, well, in the welding lab here, we use one eighth of an inch. And it depends on how thick the material is, how, how, how great a heat sink it creates. Dropping down to the last paragraph on page 107, it says, holding the electrode at the correct angle while it is buried in the joint, the welder must observe the formation of the puddle 
and the keyhole. Extremely important. As soon as sufficient metal has been built up to bridge the gap opening, he must begin to move the electrode by sliding its end in the groove, constantly maintaining a slight pressure on the end of the electrode to keep it buried. The electrode may have a tendency to stick as it is dragged along in the groove, and if this occurs, the electrode holder should be wiggled slightly while keeping the end of the electrode buried in the groove. A small keyhole will form behind the electrode, and this should be watched as the weld progresses as, as uh, well as the molten pool of metal. When the bead is about three quarters of an inch long, the arc is quenched by a quick flip of the electrode away from the keyhole. So if you're, if you're welding here, I'm just going to show you, show you up here, and you're coming along like this, and you're ready to quit, uh, the writer of this text recommends that you just flip it out just like so. Now typically I like to, I like to have you go ahead and poke it through, just like you're punching something, to open up that keyhole so we can get a good tie-in on subsequent beads. Uh, let's see, one, page 109, I want to draw your attention to figure 8.9. It says, Pos position of the electrode for downhill welding a root bead. The electrode is buried in the pipe joint by holding it in the weld with a light pressure. The high current setting allows the arc to be maintained when the electrode is in contact with the pipe. You can actually dare it to stick. You can stick it in there and just dare it to stick. Um, go ahead and read the, that page. Welding the root, ba root bead on page 110. In preparation for welding the root bead, the tack weld should be uh, deslagged and cleaned thoroughly with a wire brush. The ends of the tack weld should be ground to a sharp feather edge with a grinding wheel. This is typical of what we do in, uh, in all of our other pipe courses. When you've got that tack, you've got that tack in there like this, Here's your, here's your pipe, and it's penetrating inside the pipe. Well, this is too thick to, to weld through, so we're, you're going to take your grinder and you're going to grind it down to a fine feather edge, just like that. Going to remove all this excess metal, just like so, so it comes down to a razor edge. When you start your weld, start it up here near the peak. The idea is to burn through the tack before you reach the end of it. If you come down here, and right about here now, you've burnt through, you know you're going to have good penetration without a, without a thumbnail, without any kind of a toenail there. No lack of penetration, no lack of fusion right here. So you want to make sure that you properly prepare these, and then as you're coming out, tell yourself, burn through that tack before I reach the end of it. Also, when you're preparing this, Make sure that you don't grind beyond the end of the tack. If you grind beyond the end of the tack, and then, then you're going to start removing meat from the, from the uh, bevel. And you can get that pipe wall too thin. And if you do that, if you, if you grind that pipe wall, accidentally grind that pipe wall, by the time you come down there, okay, the, the, this tack's going to be thick enough to hold the heat, but then there's not going to be any meat in the wall of that metal, or the wall of that pipe to hold that heat, and you'll blow a big old keyhole. So when you're prepping these tacks, don't grind past the end of the tax. Okay. Page 110, write, write down the uh, second paragraph from the bottom says, to start the root bead, the arc is struck in the 12 o'clock position. It should be struck ahead of the weld in order to preheat the part of the, the joint in which the bead is to be, t be deposited. A long arc is held until the arc has stabilized and the gaseous shield has formed, and then the electrode is buried in the weld joint and kept in place with a light pressure. So. What we're going to do, if we're going to make this weld, we're going to, we've got it all tacked up. We're going to strike the arc r right here, come back and pick up our tie-in, and, and the arc's stabilized, and we're going to burn through that tack, and then we're going to come on down like this. And you want to keep that electrode pointed back into the, into the face of the puddle as you come along. By doing so, you're going to keep, keep pushing that metal up and penetrating that metal. If you get too far up like this, you might get excessive penetration, and if you, if you get like this, you're going to get too shallow penetration. So as you're coming around here, you want to keep that welding rod pointed back into the face of the puddle. Page 111, uh, the keyhole, and I'd highlight this, uh, is, necess is, is a necessary element in the formation of the weld bead. It is formed when the faces of the weld joint have melted, and it provides the space for the molten metal to flow to the bottom of the weld joint, thereby assuring that the weld bead will penetrate to the root. The solid weld bead should extend below the surface to form a slight crown 
that must not exceed 1 16th of an inch in height. So you don't want your, your it's called your root reinforcement. That's the technical, technical name of it. You don't want your root reinforcement or your bead inside to be more than about a sixteenth of, of an inch high. So this is the inside of the pipe, about a sixteenth of an inch high. Typically, you're allowed an eighth of an inch. You're shooting for a sixteenth. I believe ASME B311 only allows a sixteenth, but typically you're allowed an eighth of an inch. And you want it to be nice and consistent, a nice consistent bead. You don't want interruptions in it. You don't want lack of fusion. You don't want lack of penetration. Any di kind of discontinuity. You don't want toenails in it. So you're shooting for a sixteenth of an inch with a nice continuous bead all the way around. Uh, and incidentally, when you get that keyhole, it's just like in any other of the joints that we've welded, whether it's plate or pipe, you got to listen for that sound of, of bacon and eggs frying in a frying pan. That's the sound of the, of, of the arc penetrating that root opening. If you hear that, you know you're getting penetration. If you don't hear that, stop. Stop immediately. Make whatever adjustments you have to to, to your amperage. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe the joint slammed up tight on you. Something's happened. If the joint slams up tight on you, you can take your grinding wheel and soften that joint and, and, and remove some of the excess metal so that you can go ahead and get through there. Uh, next page says, certain difficulties are encountered when this welding procedure is used. For example, there will always be a slight amount of undercutting at the edges of the weld as can be seen in figure 8-15. Uh, however, the undercut is not harmful to the final quality of the weld uh, in this case because it will be removed by the second or hot pass as explained later on in the text. When you put that root bead in, almost invariably it's going to undercut the sidewalls of the bevel in this downhill position. It's, it's just almost impossible to get away from it. As, as you're putting that root bead in, it's going to undercut right here and undercut right there. But Usually in downhill, in downhill welding, you're using 6010 or 7010 or 70 plus, which is an 8010 rod, all of which are high penetration electrodes. And if you get a little slag back down in here, these high penetration electrodes will generally float it out. Uh, if whatever test you're taking or whatever procedure you're working to allows you to, to grind that, you know, touch it up with a grinder. You don't have to remove, remove every speck of slag, but at least remove the overburden so that when you come back in with the next pass, that, that slag uh, will be able to float out of there. Okay, let's see. Go ahead, make sure you read. This is really good information. Make sure you read all of page 112. Uh, all of page 113, I'm reading from uh, the paragraph beginning just below the photographs on page 113. I'd highlight this. Increasing the speed of travel, however, can cause pinholes to form behind the arc, usually at a distance of about one-eighth of an inch. When this occurs, the welder must swiftly tilt the electrode uh, holder in the direction of travel and then go back to the original position, as in figure 817. Tilting the electrode causes the arc force to push some of the weld metal into this void. Uh, what, what he's talking about is when you're going around here, like so, sometimes you can get going too fast and you'll lose the puddle. You'll lose the puddle and it'll leave, leave a little hole there. Well, if you see that, you've got to go back and pick it up. Go back and pick it up. Fill that void and then continue with your weld. Um, the welder must be alert to recognize pinholes and then immediately take the corrective action. Obviously, if the weld has progressed too far beyond the pinholes, they cannot be eliminated by this procedure. But you may be able to pick them up with your hot pass. Remember, we talked about the hot pass correcting mistakes that uh, occurred with the root pass. However, if you're taking a test, most inspectors will say, uh, too bad, nice try, see you later. Okay. Flipping the page, um, page 114, stop and restart. When it is necessary to stop the weld before the bead is completed, the arc is broken by a quick flicking of the end of the electrode uh, downward away from the keyhole, as shown in figure 819. This will prevent slag from mixing with unsolidified weld metal to form a slag inclusion. And if you look at this, it says, uh, method of breaking the arc by quickly flicking the electrode downward away from the, from, away from the crater. So you're coming down like so, 
you're forming your bead, you're ready to stop, and it's just boom, just flick it right out of there. And then in very bold print, it says, this prevents slag from mixing with unsolidified weld metal, creating a slag inclusion. It says, remove slag from the crater and two inches of the bead. So before you start again, you're going to clean it up, clean that bead up two inches back, and then start again. Uh, read about tie-ins. Read about preparation for the hot pass. Then on page 116, highlight this, the hot pass. The primary objective of the second pass, called the hot pass, uh, in downhill pipe welding is to burn out the remaining slag and to complete the edge fusion between the root and the base metal. So again, you're using it to, actually, you can actually sometimes think of it as a continuation of the root bead. Uh, only a small amount of metal is added by this pass. As mentioned earlier in this chapter, the weld joint should be warm when this pass and all subsequent passes are deposited. The remaining passes should be made as soon as possible after the previous passes have been completed. Um, most welding procedures will say that it has to be 70 degrees or 55 degrees, something like that. You've got to drive out the moisture and it depends on, 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 on the type of steel you're using. If it's X42, that's, that doesn't have a high tensile strength. X65, very high tensile strength. So you're going to want to maintain about a 200 degree uh, temperature to that pipe all the time for every weld that you're going to put in there so that you don't get cracking afterwards. Reading from the uh, last sentence here in, on page 116, it says the current setting used to deposit the hot pass should be slightly higher uh, than the welding of the root bead. While an exact recommendation cannot be given, the current setting should be in the range of 110 to 150 amps DC. The same type of electrodes used to weld the root are, are used here, namely 1 8 to 5 32nd inch E6010, E6010IP, or E7010A. The electrode angle at which the electrode is held should be 10 to 15 degrees uh, in all positions around the pipe. So as you're going around the pipe, he's talking about this straight up and down, so we're going to be holding it about like this in relation to the pipe all the way around. So you're always holding it into the face of the weld as you're coming around. Very important. Incorrect rod, ang rod angle has failed more people than anything else. Okay, read the rest of page 117. Um, 118, the purpose of the up and down whipping motion is to control the weld puddle and to force some of the, of the liquid metal to flow into the corner of the weld, thereby filling any undercut. To reduce the fluidity of the puddle and to prevent overflowing, the whipping motion should be about one and one half electrodiameters long and made in the direction of welding without a change in the arc length. While whipping, the arc should be made to pause in order to deposit filler metal in the crater. Uh, the entire hot pass is deposited using the whipping procedure. As the bead is being deposited, the welder must maintain the correct electrode angle in all positions around the pipe. He must watch the formation of the bead to see that the edges are well filled with deposited weld metal. In this step, he has the assistance of the higher current flow, which burns out the slag and prom promotes edge fusion. So, as we're coming, up, coming around this now, like so, we, we, we've got our proper rod angle. You're gonna, with your hot pass, you're going to be whipping it in there using that whip that we've already learned in previous classes. And what that does is it pushes that weld puddle up, pushes it up, makes it flow into the sides. And you're also going to have a slight pause on the top side. Pause, pause, pause. Not much, but a little. And your whip is only going to be about one and a half times the diameter of the electrode. You're barely going to clear that puddle. You don't want to come out of it two inches and back because that's, go that's going to remove the gaseous shielding from the puddle. It's going to let that puddle cool off some. You don't want that. You're just barely going to whip it out and back in. Okay. Uh, intermediate passes. Um, I'm reading from the very last paragraph on page 119, and I would highlight this. Welding in the flat position at the top of the pipe presents no great difficulty for an experienced welder. As shown in figure 824, the bead is deposited by manipulating the electrode in a loop-shaped weave. The diameter of the loop should be approximately one-half to two times the diameter of the electrode, so that a gaseous shield is maintained over the molten metal at all times. When the arc is in the puddle, the electrode should pause to allow time for the additional filler metal. Well, now we're talking about intermediate passes. So on the intermediate passes, when you're welding across the top here, our, uh, the author of this book is suggesting using a, a type of loop to spread that puddle out, and that's fine. 
using this little loop method like this to, to make sure you feel the entire joint, there's not a darn thing wrong with it in that flat position. And it's very effective. So I would make sure that you understood that portion. Going over to the next page, 121, I, I like that figure 826 because it shows, it shows the electrode in relationship to the pipe. And you can see that he's trying to maintain a 10 to 15 degree angle at all times as he's going around there. As I said, you want to keep that electrode pointed back into the face of the puddle um, in order to get it to spread out. You don't want that puddle to get ahead of you at all or it's going to really cause you some problems. Uh, let's see, reading from the middle of page 121, it says, when the tendency of the puddle to roll downward lessens noticeably, the welding speed can be slowed down and the electrode angle changed back to a normal 10 to 15 degrees. Usually this occurs near the 4 o'clock position. The slant weave is continued until overhead welding starts uh, near the 5 o'clock position. So as he's coming down here, he's, he's got to increase that, in, coming down the side of the pipe, he's got to increase his angle some. Uh, because gravity is going to try to pull that down. But then as he gets back down over here and he's got control of it again, he can go back to a slightly less uh, eccentric angle. Page 122, uh, last paragraph before we got on, get into the cover pass, it says the joint must be evenly filled with weld metal before the cover pass is made. Therefore, additional beads called strippers, um, in my experience we've called them pisser passes, but stripper sounds, sounds a little more politically correct, so <laughs> stripper beads uh, will frequently have to be deposited on the sides of the joint as shown in figure 828. Uh, where's figure 820 right? Yeah, you can see along the sides here, what he's, the, the picture they're showing us there. You gotta remember, as you're, as you're coming down the side of that pipe, gravity is really giving you some problems, so you may have, you may have this pipe flushed out all of there, flushed out all of there, but it's not flushed out along these sides, so you may have to build it up a little bit more using these stripper passes or you, you basically you're going to come back and I've had to do this several times when you're welding that pipe you come back and you, you pause a little more metal along that along that uh, 230 to about 330 time or 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock whatever along the side so that you build that up and remember now of course when you when you're when you're welding making that weld when you've got it filled you want to fill it to just below flush just barely below flush. Don't try to don't don't attempt to cap it uh, until you get it just really really close because you got to remember in the downhill position you're not carrying a lot of metal so you're not going to deposit a very a very heavy cap cap pass with that. Okay, your cover pass. The cover pass must be a bead with a neat appearance and having a slight crown. And again, the author saying about a sixteenth of an inch to reinforce the weld joint. The electrode, arc length, and electrode angle will be the same as those used to weld the intermediate passes. Two slightly different weaves, as shown in figure 829, are used to weld the cover pass. In each case, the weave must be wider than the previous beads in order to cover the weld joint. Uh, at the end of each weave, the electrode should pause when it is centered over the edge of the, of the previous layer, which will provide the correct bead width as well as fuse the bead with the edge of the joint without undercutting. As shown in figure 8-29, and this is the portion I'd like you to highlight, from the 12 o'clock to the 5 o'clock positions, a slant weave is used. For overhead welding, uh, from the 5 to 6 o'clock position, a semicircular weave is used. In each case, the speed of travel should be such that the weld metal will build up to, to form that 1 8 of an inch crown. To avoid undercoating and gas pockets, the correct arc length, electrode angle, and speed of travel should be maintained while the electrode is manipulated with a smooth movement. So you got to remember now we're talking about horizontal fixed, vertical down position. So you can use a, a little weave without any, without any problems. A vertical down weave is, is a very common technique. Depending on how wide it is, um, you may have to do uh, uh, stringer beads or, or multiple weave. Uh, to, to cover the entire joint, but something like the Schedule 40 pipe, that's not a problem using a, using a single weave. Okay, page 124 talks about poor fit up, read that, pipe axis at 45 degree, aka a 6G position. Uh, let's read 
page 125 underneath the photographs, it says intermediate beads are deposited in a slightly different manner than in the case where the pipes are in the 5G position. First, the electrode must be held so that it points toward the high side of the joint. Well, that's, that's typical. Remember when we were, when we were welding in, uh, in well 2510 and 2520, you always wanted to favor the overhead pipe, like so. Well, now it's just reversed. You're still favoring that overhead pipe slightly, but you're coming downhill. Why are you favoring the overhead pipe? So you don't get in internal undercut. Internal undercut, any internal undercut in excess of a 32nd of an inch deep is a, is a rejection. It's a failure. If it's under a 32nd of an inch deep, you're allowed, I believe, I, I hate to quote without my, tech, without my code book in front of me, but I believe you are allowed one inch per 12 inches of weld. It used to be two inches per 12 inches of weld, uh, but the new addition, uh, they changed that and they tightened it up a little bit, and I believe it's one inch. Uh, if anybody's curious about that, get with me and we'll, we'll get the code book out and we'll look it up. So, uh, first the electrode must be held so that it points toward the high side of the joint, as shown in figure 831, with respect to a perpendicular line from the surface of the weld. The electrode angle in a plane cutting through the weld joint should be five to or, pardon me, 10 to 15 degrees, as before. Uh, the side angle should be 25 to 30 degrees, as shown, uh, as it is in respect to the plane passing through the weld joint. The current setting and the arc length, that is one electrode diameter, are the same as used when the pipes are in the 5G position. So basically the most important thing I wanted to uh, point out to you here was that you've got to favor the upper side of that joint. But read the, read the remainder of that because as, as I said before, this, this textbook has got some really great suggestions and information for welding this pipe. Downhill pipe welding, heavy wall and large diameter. Let's uh, slip over to page 127. There's two questions that come off of these, uh, these next three paragraphs. It says, the pipe materials most encountered today for pipeline construction are LX60 and LX65 as classified by the API standards. Tensile strength, hardness, ductility, and toughness have become the focal point of changes in the welding procedure. The piping materials are classified as low alloy materials. Attaining this higher strength, the ductility and toughness will be risky in terms of higher carbon and manganese content. Underbead cracking has been experienced when working with LX56, which contains carbon and manganese near maximum acceptable limits. This pipe grade has a lower strength than the LX65 and LX60. Therefore, the composition of the steel used for pipelines must not only factor in a weldability under hydrogen-induced conditions, but also the influence on toughness uh, when the carbon and manganese content increase. Certain steels, and all of the higher strength steels, are produced by some manufacturers by adding small amounts of columbium and vanadium to gain the required strength. I'd remember those two words. Uh, these take the place of an increase in the carbon content. Knowing that carbon has a, has a detrimental effect upon fracture toughness. Fracture toughness is a much needed mechanical property that helps prevent running cracks from developing. This property is quite important in pipe, pipeline steel, where the initiation of a running crack can lead to destruction of miles of pipeline. Uh, adding columbium and vanadium, or both, along with a relatively low control finishing temperature in hot rolling, produces a fine grain, stronger steel with adequate toughness. So there's a lot of valuable information there. And in fact, reading that paragraph again, I may even add a, 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 another question. So we, you might be looking for three or four questions coming off of this stuff. The principal guide for welding pipelines is the API Standard 1104, a document written by representatives of the API, AGA, PLCA, AWS, and SNT. This standard provides the requirements for obtaining weld joints of adequate quality for gas and crude oil transmission pipelines or other high pressure services using skilled welders and commercially av available uh, materials and equipment. API 1104 also outlines the methods of testing and the test requirements for qualifying welding procedures as well as materials for a specific kind of pipe size and joint. Then flipping the page, extremely important. Um, I've made notations for four questions coming off of page 128. Pay particular attention to, the, uh, to these essential variables. It says, when a contract is awarded, the contractor is required to prepare a document called a welding procedure. 
In this document, the contractor stipulates all variables, methods, and an overall plan for executing the work in order to achieve the objective of the client and responsible agencies. The following items must be stipulated. The material to be welded, the welding process is diameter, position, direction of welding, number of welders, time lapse between passes, preheating temperature, interpass temperature, filamental classification, cleaning procedures, etc., etc., etc. Study that. Study that. Know that. Depositing root bead, heavy wall pipe, large diameter pipe. These pipes are known for their higher strength. These low alloy, higher strength pipes require the use of certain higher strength electrodes that include E8010, E7010, and E7048. Uh, uh, the last of these is a low hydrogen electrode used for downhill welding. In all cases, preheating the specified temperatures of interpass temperatures is required. I would remember that. Uh, the technique uh, to weld the, the root pass with E8010 electrode is similar to that with E6010, except the movement of the electrode from side to side is slightly limited. Um, the higher tensile strength of E8010 as compared to E6010 really cuts down on the fluidity of the puddle. Uh, it, its characteristics are quite different, and that's why you're not going to have as much, uh, as much uh, movement with E8010 as you are with E6010. It's, uh, you don't often see root beads deposited with, with E8010, um, but it does, it does take place. So uh, remember that, and then we're going to switch over. I would re read the rest of that and come over to the page 129, first paragraph here. It says, controlling the amount of undercut is important uh, because, like the electro, the base metal has a high tensile strength. 8010 has a high tensile strength. The undercut at the fusion line raises the stress. That's what I want you to remember. The undercut, undercut at the fusion line raises the stress. Why? Because undercut at the fusion line is a stress riser. If the preheating temperature is allowed to drop, the stress in the areas of the undercut increases. The weld is likely to crack because it fails to withstand the applied load. All right. There could be one or more questions coming from that, from that section there. So read it, understand it. If you don't, by this time, I am making the assumption that most people watching this video uh, have already taken some of our previous pipe welding classes and are understanding what essential variables are, what WPSs are, and so forth, because I've covered the topic um, many times in the past. If, however, uh, you come into the, this class and, and you stepped right into this class from the field and you haven't had the advantage of, of that previous information, get with me so that I can discuss in more detail with you uh, uh, some of these subjects that you that may, you may be a little vague on. Uh, when it comes time to take this test, I don't want you to, to uh, uh, fail the test or miss some questions simply because that information wasn't conveyed to you. Depositing the hot pass. The hot pass follows the root bead after the root bead is prepared. This weld layer is deposited with utmost care uh, not to create an undercut, but a weld with proper fusion along the fusion line of both sides. The third pass is deposited in a similar fashion, using a controlled arc length and a very slight weave. Filler passes and their consequences. Now remember, we're talking about uh, welding he a heavy wall pipe, large diameter pipe, and we're basically going over the same procedures, again, but with some fine tuning. Uh, filler passes and their sequences. Filler passes that are deposited on heavy wall pipes used in cross-country pipelines are welded by using stringer bead sequences instead of a weave. Uh, because the weave would get too large. Uh, on the next page, the diagram shows that the first three passes are single layer deposits, each extending across the, uh, across the bevel. The second diagram shows all of the completed sequences. So if you flip the page, you'll see that what we have is a single V joint. And uh, The first three passes, one, two, three, fill the entire joint, and thereafter, he's had to go to stringer beads to fill the remainder of the joint. Now, the, the diagram that he's given us here uh, show, uh, w was done to show certain discontinuities that can occur, such as lack of fusion, lack of fusion in here where you don't break it down, where you don't tie into all the surfaces, uh, porosity, uh, slag inclusions. Those are some of the problems that you can have. So understand, uh, study that, understand that document or that diagram and some of the discontinuities that can occur here. 
Uh, yeah, and read that because there's going to be two or three questions coming off off of uh, this this topic title filler passes and their sequences. And let's see, nice pictures of guys making wells. Let's flip to 132 and go to cover passes. Two questions, at least, coming off of the, this portion. Uh, when the pipe joint is filled almost to the surface, a pipe weld is ready to be capped using the downhill technique and stringer beads. The bevel edge should be visible on both sides to serve as a guide for depositing straight stringer beads uh, side by side as the weld is completed. I discussed that before. You want to make sure that you leave the, the upper edge of that bevel to be your guide. Uh, when the first stringer bead has been completed using the bevel edge as a guide, the second stringer bead uh, should use the inner edge of, of the first as its guide, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, dropping down to the last paragraph there, it says, an allowance should be made for the same procedure, staggering the stringer beads on all filler passes or when depositing stringers for capping. Just like in any of the, uh, of the other pipe welding courses that we've done, you want to stagger your starts and stops. As you're coming around this pipe, stagger your starts and stops. Don't, don't start and stop all in the same place. Why? If they x-ray this pipe and you've had all your starts and stops all in one spot, the chances of you getting multiple uh, discontinuities such as slag inclusion, um, undercut, uh, porosity, lack of fusion, in one small little given area it increases greatly. So if they x-ray that and you see all of the, they see all of that, all of that combined in that small area uh, could be enough to reject the weld uh, under x-ray interpretation. So, read the rest of that, and uh, on page 134, read about the composition-based unweldability influences toughness. Um, read that, page 134. There's going to be a question coming off of that, and that should be just about it. I know that was a, a brief flurry of information, but I can't emphasize enough how much I, I really like that chapter. There's an awfully a lot of good information there. And uh, read it thoroughly. If you don't understand any part of it, get with me and I'll be happy to discuss it with you. Thank you for your attention.